This is a super special episode, and it's going to drop on Tuesday instead of Friday because there's an awesome hash making event happening this weekend on April 6th in Westboro, Massachusetts. This event is called the Lost Art Workshop, and it's going to walk people through Frenchie Cannoli's process of making hashish from start to finish, taught by Madame Cannoli and Cherry Blossom Bell. I will be attending, and I literally can't wait to learn from these amazing women. If you want to join us and learn from the best teachers in hash making, click the link in the show notes of this episode or head to purplepass.com slash Westboro 2024. If you're unfamiliar with Frenchie Cannoli, he was a lover of hash who traveled the world teaching his art of hash making and also providing a glimpse on the internet with in-depth YouTube videos and beautifully written articles. I will attach some articles in the show notes and YouTube videos if you want to watch them. It is literally the best way to learn about how to make hash other than doing it yourself. Today's guests are Kimberly Hook and Kevin McGovern. Kimberly, also known as Madame Cannoli, is the widow of Frenchie who continues on the legacy of teaching the art of hashish. And Kevin McGovern is a passionate hemp cultivator and the owner of First Harvest Hemp in Massachusetts. I really hope you guys enjoy listening to the history in this episode as much as I did. And as always, thanks for listening. So um, I'm Kimberly. I'm Frenchie's widow. We met about 42 years ago in Nepal. Um, it was for a full moon party where they had made a concoction with a lot of charas, which is the hand rub concentrate that you find in northern India and Nepal. And Frenchie was a lifeline aficionado of hash making. So he studied with uh, producers all over the world, um, with Afghan friends, refugee friends in the uh, India, uh, in Pakistan, in Morocco, um, and then later had the wonderful opportunity when um, we had legalization here in California uh, to start teaching young people about what was hashish because uh, the prohibition on drugs in the U.S. was so effective. The feds really were so good at putting all the people who were bringing hashish from producing countries into the United States that we have a couple generations of people who don't even know what hashish truly is. Um, so I am continuing his legacy with his apprentice. Her name's Laura Bell, and she's currently um, the, manufact- uh, the director of manufacturing at a um, facility in Northern California in Ukiah. That's excellent. And I'm Kevin McGovern from First Harvest Hemp. Um, I started growing uh, hemp in 2018 when the program started in Massachusetts. Um, I'm a third generation farmer. I grew up on a dairy farm, hence the bullhead. And, um, you know, the first time I experienced real hash was actually in Amsterdam in 2010. Um, I went there with a friend and it was readily available and, and I had never experienced that in the States before. So I kind of fell in love with it then. And, um, you know, did a little research on how to make it and did some small experimentation myself, but um, I'm really just get, getting into it now, especially with CBD. Um, you know, s- certain strains have really come a long way and um, get, getting into different cultivars and which ones wash well and press well is something I'm re- very interested in. So I'm very excited about the, the workshop coming up and it's an honor to have the French cannoli brand in, in house. So I'm very excited. Wow, it's going to be awesome. So Kimberly, you were saying that a lot of people, especially younger people, weren't super familiar with what hashish was and, you know, the importance of it. Would you mind kind of diving into exactly what it is for any listener who might have only smoked cannabis flower before and might not really know what hashish is? Sure. You know, we have a bit of a controversy in North America in that we use the term hashish very generically to describe almost any concentrate. It's almost like we were using it, like we use the term dairy when we talk about milk products. But when you're in Europe or when you're in producing countries, hashish refers to very specifically the pressed mass of trichome heads um, that you make uh, using dried cannabis uh, flour um, or plant material using a sieving process. So, um, you know, there's a few different ways this has been done in Afghanistan. They have 
uh, large, almost like bed frames that they stretch seaving cloth over the top of that. And you'll have a person that holds it and gently moves it on either end. And then somebody in the middle that just rubs the material lightly over the seaving cloth so that you get the trichome heads that separate from the stalk of the, of the plant and fall down. And with each successive pass that they do, they create dimensions of quality, um, grades of quality. And then this material, depending on the country that you're in, is pressed into rectangles to store because traditional hashish is aged for a time before it's it's smoked. And so um, this is a sieved process. Um, and the big difference with other products that are referred to as hash, notably rosin in the in North America, is that that's an extracted process. You take a further step and you would take that loose resin and press it uh, with a source of, again, some heat, but pressure to separate the resin from the head. You're leaving the cellular membrane behind and you're creating a new product. And this is rosin. And so uh, I've been having kind of ongoing conversation with people on social media about the use of this term, because a lot of times people will come up at events and they'll say, oh, Madam Canoli, I wanna show you my hash and they'll extend a jar and I'll be excited thinking, oh, they're making hashish and it'll be rosin. And I think my face falls a little bit and they probably wonder what's going on, but it's just confusion in terminology and how this is used in you know, these producing countries or countries that are landlocked to producing countries. So you have the product that's coming naturally overland to Europe from the producing countries and the United States is again, because of the success of the war on drugs become like a big Island. And so um, while we're so innovative and it's great that we have uh, developed all these other forms of concentrate, um, I think we need maybe more vocabulary so that we have clarity on what we're talking about. I love the way that you describe that with um, the, the resin still being inside the trichome and that being hashish. And then when you're pressing it out and that oil is being removed from that, that's when it really becomes a different thing. It becomes rosin. We, we it becomes an extract. Terminology. Yeah. I mean, it really is that classic, you know, an extract is using force to separate something. Um, in the definition, they talk about removing a tooth or removing oil from the, the land to create, you know, gasoline products. Um, yeah, so both are great products. It's not like it's not a question of having a bias against one or the other because, um, um, you know, I want there to be choices. Frenchie used to describe the products very, very differently. He talked about Frenchie was a huge lover of caffeine and coffee, mm -hmm. um, but he said, you know, Same. In the afternoon, it wasn't always a fit for him to drink more coffee. So he would take a dab and he said, you know, for him, dabbing rosin was like a sharp punch and that he would feel energetic for a bit of time, but that it was a short high. Whereas when he smoked his traditional hashish, he always said it gave him an overall feeling of well-beingness um, okay. and that it was like, he said it's like being enveloped in a fluffy um, blanket on a um, uh, a rug in front of a fire. Um, oh. So it's a cozy feeling for him. Oh, and the feeling of being hugged. What a wonderful yeah. feeling. And so <laughs> That's nice. I really wonder if a lot of the people who are kind of having this little bit of a cultural war with me on the terminology... I wonder if they've actually consumed hashish ever and have been able to like make the difference because I often say to them, you know, if we were in the dairy industry and we were having commerce between each other and I ordered ice cream from you and you sent me yogurt, I would be a little bit like uh, disappointed. Right. <laughs> Not that I didn't like yogurt, but just I ordered ice cream. Uh, right. Right. And, and it's I, okay to have multiple words to describe. It's almost better to have multiple words to describe differences. Cause then as you're saying, you know what you're getting and it's a better descriptor of that product. But yeah. I agree. I mean, I do think the word, the word hash has been used to describe literally anything that comes in a, in an <laughs> extract type product. And, and I mean, yeah, to each their own, but, but I would agree that they, that, there are differences and we should respect that and respect the tradition uh, associated with hashish with that name. 
there's a lot of history behind that word too mm -hmm. that goes way way back kim you can speak on that correct yeah and again you know um there's a great study that was done for a UN um, paper on this topic by a researcher in Spain. I'll have to share it with you guys because it looks at the lexicon, the pharmacopoeia of various countries and how they use the different terminologies. So it's not just with this one term. It's all over the map. You know, people kind of, especially the colonists, when they would go to a country they kind of made things up as they went along or they were confused by what they were being told by, by local people, maybe because they weren't understanding the language or they didn't really understand the product. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to create clarity as we move towards a worldwide legalization when potentially we'll be trading both you know, um, interstate and internationally. We have some of the best cannabis producing um, terroir uh, places to grow cannabis in the world, notably nor in Northern California and Southern Oregon and parts of upstate New York have beautiful country for that cannabis really thrives in and creates very yeah. specific kind of flavor profiles. Um, so conceivably, you know, we should have some market on in that quality area and yeah, we're going to need, clarity on how we talk, talk about the products that we want to share with each other. Absolutely. And um, you talked about um, the sieving of hash with these different uh, micron um, sieves. <laughs> um, would you mind, we don't need to go into full detail about every single step of the process, but I would really love to focus on like what was so special about Frenchie's process and not, I mean, obviously the process, but also I think something that really made Frenchie stand out was how open he was and he wanted to share it and he really wanted everyone to you know have the experience of touching and smelling and feeling and all the sensory components of hash making and I think that even comes out in terroir where that was so important to him and because it's it's the whole process it's the love of the plant you know and I think he really showed his love and appreciation and how that can come out in a final beautiful product um so I would just love you know for you to kind of explain his method of hash making and and how he taught the world how to make hash so I think what was a little different with Frenchie and my um he was one of the first people to say I don't make the quality. The quality is given to me. I'm so blessed. He would say, you know, I'm so blessed to work with these farmers in Northern California that have been risking their freedom for generations within their families and that they really have focused on producing the best cannabis possible that when they give that to me or give it to Frenchie, you know, he was able to really, um, through the process of ice water sieving, make such a clean product that that flavor really stood out. And um, basically the only big difference between what Frenchie's doing and what's being done in traditional hash producing countries is the addition of water to the process. In a traditional hash producing country, it's dry sieving. So again, they're using some kind of stretched cloth um, and um, moving the dry plant material over it to separate the trichome head where the resin is at from the plant material. And it's very hard to create a really perfectly clean product when you're doing that because as you're rubbing the material, you're breaking off little bits of the plant and it's getting mixed in with the trichomes, which is not the end of the world. But when you add water to this process, now you can separate the two aspects of sieving, which are agitation of the material and then sieving it through the cloth. When you do it with water, you agitate in the washing machine, but you separate in the bags, which allows you to make a much cleaner product. And then in the bags, you can additionally clean it again using the fan setting on the hose that you, the sprayer that you're using um, so it's just allowed people to go to a whole other level of cleanliness. And you see this in some of the great hash makers um, on internet, on the, uh, Instagram that are just showing these amazing macro photos of perfectly clean trichome heads. 
Um, I love those macro photos. I could look at those all day long. All day long, right? <laughs> There's something primordially where you're just like, as a human, yeah. you're drawn to it. I know. Um, and I think Frenchie's big difference was he talked about dimensions of ripeness. So he would wash one um, machine of plant material 10 to 12 times. And then he would make the temple balls from that and you and line them up. And you can see that he, he kind of um, talked about it as if it was a tree of fruit. So when you shake the tree the first time, it's going to be the most ripe stuff that falls off. And maybe there's some that might be ever so lightly overripe. And then you shake it again from a second wash and you're getting the next dimension of ripeness. And a lot of times, so Frenchie has a Facebook group where he um, uh, takes questions and encourages people. And so I've continued to um, curate that group for him. People yeah. will say, oh, I washed this four times and the yield wasn't so great. And then I'll say, well, the problem there is it takes a while when you're in washing for the trichomes to really let loose. And Frenchie, as I mentioned, would wash 10 to 12 times and you would see like sometimes around the fifth or sixth wash, the balls will get much larger because as you're shaking that tree, you're getting more fruit that falls. Um, and so doing this, if we were to analyze it, the cannabinoid profile of the various balls would be slightly different from the overripe to the less ripe. And from a therapeutic perspective, those different cannabinoids are good for different psychological and physical needs. And so Frenchie was just so curious about all this potential. And when we do the workshops, we talk to people and we say, you know, as a small producer, as a artisanal hash maker, you're not going to be able to compete with the big guys in terms of volume, but you don't want to because you can compete in quality and you can also then further, you know, kind of specialize on certain aspects of this, on where the plant's grown, on what cultivar you use, on what dimension of ripeness you promote as your signature style. Um, it was so exciting for Frenchie to think about all these various ways that hash makers regionally could create a name for themselves and start to create almost like their dynasty. You know, when you think of, I don't know, like Louis Vuitton, they say that his great, great grandfather had a little, you know, like cupboard um, somewhere in, uh, in France where he made, I don't know what, if it was the um, suitcases or whatever to start with. And little by little, the quality of that work created this brand that's now, you know, so Massive. insanely large. Um, so our hope is through planting these seeds that we really inspire quality because the quantity is going to be there. And we all know that when it comes to hash making, just like almost anything else in the world, you can't do the good stuff if you do it in too large a volume. Um, so, yeah. And I think it's, it's playing out. There's some people out there that studied with Frenchie that are doing beautiful, beautiful stuff. Oh, absolutely. His legacy absolutely lives on in such beautiful and diverse ways. I love seeing what people are doing. And I love what you're talking about with these different ripeness of apples, trichomes, you know, falling down and how that affects the the person and how a hash maker, depending on how their body reacts to certain chemistry, like they might gravitate towards a certain ripeness and kind of be known for that. And I think that's really cool because it kind of shows a little bit about the brain of the hash maker too and and how that product reacts with their brain. Um, uh, man, I hope we get more science on that because I want to study how the different chemistry changes with with every single wash. I think that would be absolutely amazing. Kevin, do you have anything to add before we uh, well, move I, on? I have a, so, so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, I'm curious to know what makes a cultivar a good washer? What variables, you know, factor in there? And, and does maturity also, does maturity have uh, an effect on yield and a, a cultivar's ability to wash? Well, absolutely. You know, I mean, because the if trichomes are secondary metabolites, but yet they cover the surface of the, the plant 
you know, as a protective feature, they're almost like a set, there's a sunscreen aspect, there's an attracting certain insects and repelling others, you know, um, so there's definitely, and also when it comes to the trichome head development and the resin filling that up, that's definite, there's definitely an ax, a, aspect of maturity there. Frenchie used to say that, you know, for hash making, the plant needs to grow somewhere between 10 days to two weeks longer than if you're harvesting for flower, because that would happen quite frequently uh, in the beginning when he was working. A farmer would give him some material and um, when he'd wash it, the bags would be really light. And then when he would go to try and press it, it wouldn't press well because there wasn't, it wasn't fully developed. And he would always go back to the farmer and say, you harvested this early, didn't you? And it would invariably be like, yeah, it was going to rain. So we went and pulled it. And so it was actually earlier than early. Um, so there are a variety of things that uh, impact that. And there are some cultivars that have been bred to um, be good for hash, so to speak, you know, as the, the industry has developed. Um, that said, there are certain cultivars where the yield may not be huge, but what it does produce is amazing. I know there was one um, cherry cultivar, I'm not remembering the name exactly. It had a terrible yield. It was very challenging to work with and it made an amazing hashish. So I think there's sometimes a little bit that, that balance too of wanting to produce, okay, of course you wanna make money, but um, kind of, uh, I'll tell you the insider secret, hash making is not super profitable. Uh, you know, there are other concentrates that are much more profitable than traditional hash making. Uh, right. So I think it's going to come sometimes down to almost the rarity of what you produce. Um, and then also, I think there's going to emerge like wine certain cultivars grown in certain places that just respond to the environment in a very special way. I don't mm. know if you guys have heard of this cultivar um, called White Thorn Rose. No. Um, so it's out of uh, Humboldt. And this is a cultivar um, uh, where the person who's currently growing it, his mother started it, um, you know, like generations ago, and he's continued it. And it's developed a very signature style um, out of Humboldt and has won a number of cups and is very popular in California. And instead of being kind of a flavor of the month situation where, you know, people keep changing what they grow, he's continued to grow this one cultivar in his area. And it's been quite talked about. And so I think now he's one of the rare people that I'm aware of that have developed a signature cultivar for his farm for that terroir. And Frenchie really encouraged people to kind of look into this and explore. You know, there's a lot of people um, who have been uh, like breeding for a while that almost like have vaults of secret stuff that they don't uh, continue to, to work on. Um, and that he really felt that there were going to be certain cultivars that, it, that really develop this signature for an area and that that was something in the future that was going to be very interesting instead of always trying to change and create new flavors. Very, very interesting plant, isn't it? <laughs> She's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I would also love to talk about aging temple balls a little bit and um, really what's happening there because there's a lot of chemical changes and we don't need to get into, you know, all the chemistry, but it is my background and I'm a little obsessed with it. And especially um, <laughs> talking about hashishin, uh, the, the terpene that was found, discovered because it was in very high amounts in temple, ball, in temple balls and traditional hash. And um, it was later found that it was a, um, I don't want to say breakdown product, a transformation product of myrcene, which is a different yeah. terpene. But, you know, this is not the only thing that's happening. There's hundreds of different things happening as that temple ball ages. And, you know, that's that's such an important part, those chemical transformations for the actual feeling and the quality that you get out of that final hashish. Um, can we talk about the process of aging hash a little bit and maybe like the different feelings you get from different amounts of time uh, that we aged hash? 
in I process don't think we've too. Studied that very well yet. You know, Frenchy did um, started to try and put some parameters around that and um, get some lab results from that. Working with a team in Canada out of High North Labs, they were only able to do a six month study, and um, after the uh, pandemic, we were trying to organize to do, you know, um, more work on that, but it was going to take quite a bit of money. And then, you know, unfortunately, with Frenchie's passing, that kind of got put to the side. But on our website, there is a page um, where he talks about his interest uh, of aging hashish and a little bit about what this limited study did. Um, you know, part of the wonder of working with hashish Sometimes people create a product where they're not quite satisfied with it. And we always tell them, age it for six months to a year. And the magic of some of the terpenes will transform this material. And you'll be surprised with, you know, what, what, what that uh, new product will look like. So we don't know what we don't know on this uh, <laughs> still. Frenchie, the oldest temple ball he smoked was a 12-year-old Royal Nepalese temple ball. And they Whoa. used to do a technique where they would take the charas and rub it to create a very homogenized ball with no oxygen space in the inside. And then rub it on an um, enamel plate so that some of the oils would rise to the surface. And then when dried, that create a hard outer shell to protect it from the environment. And Frenchie said that when this was cracked open, the person had to use almost like an ice pick to round. It was so hard. But when it cracked open, it was very much like a caviar, very um, supple in the inside and had an incredible smell to it. So I know that normally there's a concern with aging or with shelf life of unpressed material, which is true. You know, unpressed material is not shelf stable. It hasn't um, gone through the partial decarb. But when you press material, the, the concern of, you know, the transformation from THC into CBN, you know, we think is it's much slower than people realize. And French mm -hmm. used to joke and say, you know, they uncovered a few years ago um, the grave of a shaman in northern um, China where they had, he had six large um, cannabis fronds across his chest and they tested it and it was still active for THC. Of course there was CBN there, but this was, um, I think the grave is dated to 2,400 years ago. So wow. French used to joke and say, see the transformation is not as quick as you think. Uh, <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So I, we, he also used to talk and say that he thinks there's going to be ultimately a market for aged hashish that will be similar to aged wine and that it will, you know, merit a premium in terms of price. Um, so, you know. I think he was another right. Another area for uh, potential development. Well, um, also, can I call you Madam Cannoli? Is that okay? Oh, sure, absolutely. Okay, okay. Well, Madam Cannoli, um, if you ever want to do that type of research, um, our research nonprofit, we can help raise money and, and spread the message. And, you know, you can disseminate the information and share the legacy. But our nonprofit would love to collaborate on that if you ever want to uh, deep dive into that further. That would be amazing. Excellent. We should talk more. We Excellent. should talk more. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's something that I've studied in the past is the the chemical transformations happening during the smoking process, because the same thing when you add that that high heat, it's not just THC anymore. It's not just CBD anymore. It's not just these terpenes. Everything's rearranging and turning into new chemistry. And that's why smoking feels different. And that's why hash feels different. And that's why hash that's age six months feels different than three month aged hash. You know, it's every every chemical transformation is so important on, you know, the human perspective and an objective level. So I think that's really cool that he was talking about that when he was because it was so ahead of the time. And it's still so relevant to the science we're seeing now. Well, if, if I'm not correct, Frenchie kind of stumbled upon this when he experienced heavier hashes in different parts of the world. Is that correct, Kim? Well, um, he knew about this, obviously, from smoking, you know, um, in Morocco, where uh, traditionally back in the day, it was a more uh, CBN forward uh, hashish that occurred there. Um, in part because they had the tradition of drying the material outside on the roofs. 
and in the fields. Um, so, you know, this kind of intense exposure post-harvest uh, created some of that um, transformation from THC into CBN. Right. Um, yeah. So should, should, should concentrate or extract be partially decarb before consuming? Is it an advantage to do that? Because, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of us think that it, it gets decarbed during combustion, but he wrote that, that wonderful article, The Darker Side, in which he said that is not the most optimal process to activate all of those can cannabinoids. And he has put the math in there that shows that at some point, you know, the heat, um, is going to be so high that you're going to have that uh, transformation from THC8 into THC. It's going to go quicker than into CBN once right. you reach a certain heat. So it's kind of like through pressing through this intuitive knowledge that the you know producing countries had, they understood that partially decarbing the material before you smoked it make more of it available to you than if you just expose the um, raw trichome heads to heat. Um, and there's some scientific articles where they've actually measured what that, what that conversion is. Um, Frenchie has a couple of them on his website. Very interesting stuff. That is interesting. And it's interesting that the traditional methods, um, as you were saying, Madam Canoli, like they figured it out just from effects. Like they didn't have an HPLC, a mass spec, any of these tools that our labs yeah. use. They were just using hashish right. and smoking hashish. And they said, wow, you know, this one feels better than this one. This one feels different. This one's stronger. And they refine their method through trial and error. And I think that's really beautiful because you know it was a community event and you know people got together and shared this hashish and shared their experiences and, you know, right. learned from that and, and moved on. So it's really cool. Very cool. I still have the PTSD. I still am very much like we have to hide everything. Um, because, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, when we were young, when we were traveling, every time we would go back to Europe, they would be like, I know you have something and I'm going to find it. And I would be, no, I don't. And no, you don't. Right. <laughs> we, were, we were so lucky. Um, yeah, we had kind of crazy angels looking over our shoulder. Um, the but, hash gods were looking over you. Yeah, because so many people did have, you know, terrible experiences, especially people trying to move quantity. Um, you know, there's some very harrowing tales around that. Have you guys read the book Tie Stick? Um, so oh. that was done by a journalist. Um, it stick. was by Peter Maguire and Mike Ritter. I think M Mike Ritter was the journalist. Uh, I might be um, flipping it back and forth. But um, the one was the... Uh, uh, person transporting and the other is talking to him about his experiences and he tells so many tales from back in the day and you know some of it's um, very inspiring it's all about you know the surfers from uh, Laguna Beach that uh, you know the brotherhood of eternal love that were the first ones to go to Afghanistan and bring container loads of uh, half sheets back to the United States. They're also the ones that were uh, making LSD and trying to uh, change the world through uh, experiencing kind of togetherness through uh, 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 LSD. But uh, I thought it was really well documented having lived through the, those time periods. And um, it just goes to show to some of the waste of money the you know the dea going after these people and imprisoning them. and still do like there's so many things that we can put that money towards that can actually help our society and we're putting away healers like we're putting away people who are supplying medicine and like providing experiences and healing people from the inside out it's so 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 frustrating to see yeah yeah i'm gonna read that book though thank you for that recommendation yeah no i really enjoyed it i thought but it was uh, good documentation of the period and uh, the creativity of the and the bravery of those young people and some of the tragedy around, you know, the people getting busted and getting caught and locked up for long periods of time.
You know, last year I was I was writing a paper on cannabis and in the acknowledgments I tried to put to the people who risk their lives to provide medicine for their community w- during prohibition. And the reviewers came back to me and said, <laughs> this does not belong in the publication and you have to delete this in order for it to get published. And I was like, why can I not acknowledge people in my paper? Like, that's insane that they're trying to tell me who I can acknowledge in a publication mm-hmm. about cannabis, like in- insanity. Yeah, it's backwards. Now, can we talk about this event coming up a little bit more on April 6th? So this is a workshop where Frenchie basically did the whole process from A to Z and uh, started with a uh, what he referred to as the science behind lecture to help people understand um, why they were doing what they were doing. And then we do a demo using a very inexpensive mini washer to show how you can wash the material. Um, We explain how to dry it afterwards and then what the whole process of pressing, storage and aging looks like. So it's a full day's workshop. Um, It's now being led by uh, Frenchie's apprentice, Belle, who uh, lived and worked with him for 10 years. And now, as I mentioned, is director of operations for Heritage Mendocino. Um, where she's using a 500 gallon machine um, and washes, you know, incredible amounts. Um, so she's kind of uh, very well, uh, you know, kind of educated to be able to speak to all aspects, both for the do-it-yourselfer and the commercial person who's looking to improve their um, their processes. And so, uh, thanks to First Harvest Hemp, we're going to be doing this in Massachusetts in Westboro on um, April 6th. And um, we're gonna be doing this with hemp material because a trichome is a trichome. It doesn't matter if we work with cannabis or with hemp. And um, Frenchie smoked hemp hash and had experience with that and was very interested in the therapeutic aspect of kind of the body high that that created um, for people, especially managing pain. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to be coming to Massachusetts and to be doing the workshop. Very excited to have you. Absolutely. Like I said, a lot of the CBD strains have come a long way since legalization and, um, we're working with some really nice material. So I'm very excited to show you. So that's your material that you grew, Kevin, right? That's, that's correct. Um, it's a strain called Cakeberry Brulee and it was bred by Oregon CBD. They do a really good job. Cool. That was my next question. That's awesome. So um, have you found it difficult to find strains that were good for hash making in the hemp CBD space? This is me just dipping my toe in. So um, this is the first year I really tried it. And, uh, you know, the yield wasn't the best, but the material really came out nice and actually smells like maple syrup. So I'm happy with Ooh. it. <laughs> That's cool. Um, So you're just experimenting with it. I'm really excited to see how your age temple balls are going to, you know, what the effects are going to be from a CBD age temple ball, because we even have evidence that some CBD can turn into THC and many other bioactive compounds, you know, not readily, small amounts, but still like how many of those different chemical reactions that are happening are turning into different compounds that are acting on your CB1 receptors or other receptors in your body. I think that's right. going to be a really cool uh, experiment and I'm excited to learn more about what you find. Yeah. And like you said, we have the tools to watch that kind of profile develop over time. So this is really a, a fun time. Absolutely. So just for any listener who wants to attend the event and learn um, how to make hash in this traditional way from Frenchie's legacy, how do people um, sign up for the event and um, where do they go to, to learn more about it? So um, we use a ticket sale platform called Purple Pass. And so if you just go www.purplepass.com forward slash Westboro 2024, and it'll pull up all the information about the workshop. We've got some description there. And then um, if you're interested in getting tickets, you can purchase them there. Awesome. I'll put that in the show notes. We'll stay up until um, Friday evening at 10 o'clock. And the workshop is on Saturday. Awesome. We're very excited for this. I bet you guys are so excited. Do you guys throw events at your farm normally? Or is this kind of a special thing? Um, it's, it's, we've thrown a couple. Yeah. So it's a smaller venue. Yeah. But it's, it's perfect for this. It's for a half workshop. Yeah. It's a nice box. Awesome. Yeah. 
Well, um, thank you both for one, thinking of this podcast to get this information out and telling the story of Frenchie and his legacy that continues on. And I'm really excited to see that in Massachusetts and just to, to continue to spread the wor word and the knowledge and the education and the community aspect of cannabis consuming and making and just the full art form of it. Frenchie had a dream um, and it was actually shared with me by uh Alice from Girls in Green 710. I don't know if you're aware of the Brazilian. Uh, of uh, course, I'm I'm familiar with Alice. I okay, love so watching she's her. She's one of uh, Frenchie's students, but she told me, he told her he wanted to train 100 women hash makers because he had this idea that women were just more intuitively attuned to the plant and that also something to do with their smaller hands made it better for hash making. I do have small hands. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, you know, obviously he had some success with, he trained the Dank Duchess, Belle, Lena from Canna M Gardens, you know, uh, Alice from Girls in Green. And we've been trying to the extent of the possible to create opportunities to have more women join us. When we did the workshop in San Francisco recently, we created a reduced price option because, you know, um, technically women in most aspects of employment in the U.S. earn substantially less than men. Yeah. So, um, and that did work quite nicely for us to have more women attend the workshop because um, in many situations, it's mostly men who attend the workshop because it's a very male dominated industry. And we'd love to see a little bit more uh, balance in, in that and have more women working directly with the plant the way that Bill does or Lena does. Um, I love that, especially because it is a female plant and like that yeah, femininity yeah. is just kind of ingrained in cannabis. And I really appreciate you lowering the barrier of entry for women. No, my pleasure. I love, love that. There seems to be a bit of a bias by the fact that we're using hemp and that we're not using cannabis in this workshop, which is, you know, super interesting because technically a trichome is a trichome. Um, and I think it's just, again, people not really having experience with these other products and maybe a bit of a bias. There's been such an effort in the U.S. of these past, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 years with breeding for THC, breeding to have yeah. excessive THC. There was a study done by Lumiere Labs in Israel, I think it's 2011 or so, where they, they as in many studies, they got a lot of their material from drug busts and mm -hmm. they looked at, they did a kind of comparison between charas from northern Indi India and then hashish from Afghanistan, Lebanon. I think there was some from Pakistan and Morocco. And when Frenchie originally read the study, he was like, oh, there must be something wrong with their machine. These percentages are way off. Like the THC of the charas was the highest, and it was, I think, 12% in the study. Wow. Um, but the thing that was very interesting was most of the cultivars were very balanced. They were either higher in the CBD or balanced THC CBD. And, um, you know, especially the Lebanese French, you talked about, you know, like um, remembering smoking such great Lebanese back in the day. And that, of course, you got very high from it. And it was a beautiful experience. But how could it possibly be, you know, get you that high when the THC was so low? And so I think it was this acknowledgement that we don't know what we don't know mm -hmm. about the actual process of how it impacts the human um, brain and the role of the terpenes and the other flavor elements that are still being studied so much and how they all interact and impact the overall experience. Um, and I think this is a little bit detrimental to the wider use of cannabis in North America that we have this reading for excessive THC because in a lot of people, myself included, too much THC causes anxiety and people are not gonna want that product. And maybe if we could get more people doing things that were high CBD or more balanced, that that might open up the market to wider consumers. And I Definitely. think I saw, um, so one um, Belushi who has the dispensary in Southern California, I saw him talking about this and how he was trying to get dispensaries to carry 
a lower THC product. And they were all like, no, if it's less than, I don't know if it's like 25, 30%, which was back when we were still active, it was if it's anything less than 20, we don't, we won't even look at it. Um, and his frustration with the dispensaries not being willing to take a chance on a lower THC product. So I think that's something that we're going to need to study and talk about a little bit more too. Um, I feel like that also like separates the people who love the plant and just like love the the market around cannabis, you know, because like I love the plant so much. So I love hemp flower. I love, you know, type one THC dominant flower. I love a balanced product because that's what nature intended, those synergies and having multiple different molecules that might look pretty similar, but they have slightly different roles in the plant mm -hmm. and in our brain. And that like similar redundancy and chemical similarity, but diversity is like the beautiful thing about natural products, about flour, about hashish. And when we, you know, modify it too much or we refine it too much, it's not the same feeling. It's not the same. Yeah. yeah it's, it's just not the same experience at all. And honestly, the medicinal potential is lowered as well when we just focus on only THC and like, that's all we care about. Right. I think I saw it for Frenchie. It was so therapeutic for him in a variety of ways that I just wish, I think it's a well-kept secret that this could be such a wonderful thing for elderly people, people who are aging. As your body starts to be a little cranky and a little bit, you know, less mobile, I think there's probably, and I think this is probably why big pharma is so against it. It's like this well-kept secret that if we <laughs> gave hashish to all these elderly people, that they would have more mobility. Frenchie had um, arthritis throughout his body and he used to wake up in the morning with his hands very hard to move, very clenched. And he used to eat um, hashish like six or seven little tiny balls with his coffee in the morning. And then mm -hmm. within about 20 minutes, he would have the flexibility returned. And so I just can't help but feel, imagine all of those elderly people that are taking drugs where the side effects also maybe diminishes their cognitive powers or creates haziness, and that they can have this body high through a, a, a product that's balanced for their therapeutic needs, that's inexpensive, that could be done by their local, I, you know, like in my perfect view, view, there's like your village hash maker that's taking yeah. care of you know, like a local community and is appreciated for this joy and this well-beingness that he's bringing to the, or he or she is bringing to the, the local community. Um, there's just a lot that we could do with the plant that, I mean, we know this. I was reading a paper Frenchie wrote about Jack Herrera just before we got on the call because it was about him. And That's I'm my gonna, favorite strain of all time, like hands down. I such love it. A, an amazing person. Um, advocate in person as well. Yeah. Advocacy. Um, and yeah, just thinking about um, that and hemp and just all the possibilities. Um, and we've just, I think we've become the industry through a few big players has allowed itself to narrow in a way that's not taking advantage of what the plant has to offer. Um, so it's kind of exciting. We know that there's much more potential than, than is being used. Right. It is exciting. There's, there's so much space, especially as we kind of go back towards the, the more traditional methods of, of creating hash and growing flour that has lower THC, but more diversity of compounds. Um, I think that's really where we're going to see at least some parts of the industry start to shine and that the medicine start to come through a lot more and the community come through a lot more around growers and hash makers and healers in general. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I'm so excited for April 6th. I'm going to put a big star on my calendar. Um, <laughs> I appreciate you both so much and excited to meet in person. Yeah. I'm so glad you can join us. <laughs>